Vivian Hart. I am the president of the League of Women Voters of Greater Tucson. Welcome. Welcome to our voter education program. Gun safety in Tucson, staying safe. The people on our panel today are Tucson Chief of Police, Chris Magnus. NRA member, Sherry Hoskinson. And a member of Moms Demand Action, Kelly Ireland. And our moderator is longtime Tucson journalist, Nancy Montoya. introduce the chair of the committee that put this wonderful event together, Kathy Donalds. I am thrilled to see you all here today. Um, over the months that I have been preparing for this, I have learned a tremendous amount about the laws we have in Arizona concerning firearms, or more accurately, the laws we do not have. By seeking out opinions from many sources, I have even come to modify some of my strong views I have about them. I believe all of us, gun owners and non-gun gun owners alike, agree that we would like to keep people safe from gun violence. Perhaps this panel in its diversity can help us to do that. We are very privileged to have as our moderator for this program, Nancy Montoya. Nancy has over 40 years of experience in journalism and has won four MAs at Columbia University's Alfred DuPont Silver Baton for her coverage of the civil wars in Central America for ABC News. This is big. Those of you from Tucson will probably know her best as the former senior reporter for border and immigration issues at Arizona Public Media. She and her husband now produce independent documentaries through their own company, and she is also a senior communication specialist at the University of Arizona's Marketing and Communications Department. Nancy. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so nice to have everyone here. Uh, I look around this room and I see many people I recognize. Many of you are longtime friends. Um, and I ask that, you know, this can be a very touchy subject, it can be very emotional. Uh, but if we treat each other with some respect, I think we're going to learn more and we can become a better educated community. So I know you're not going to let me down, right? Everybody's going to be respectful. Okay, my husband's down there, and he's going to make sure you are. So. Anyway, uh, I'm going to introduce to you our panelists, tell you a little bit more about them, and then we're going to allow them to just, you know, for 10, 15 minutes, talk a little bit about where they come from in regards to gun safety and gun laws and gun violence. Chief Chris Magnus has been in law enforcement for many years, and we no longer give the years. We, we both say long time or many years, uh, including as police chief of Richmond, California, where the chief was very effective in strengthening the ties between the community and its police force. And if you ask me, that's what he's doing here in Tucson. Uh, he was appointed police chief for the city of Tucson in January of uh, 2016, boy, it's been five years now almost. Um, also, he has a, a deep commitment for, uh, uh, to help victims of domestic violence, sexual violence, addressing community corrections issues, and focusing on how police respond to people suffering with mental illness. Um, I'm very, I feel very lucky to have him as our police chief and have him here today. Thank you. And these are two ladies I'm just now getting to know, so I'll get to know them a lot better. Uh, Sherry Hos Hoskinson spent 20 years with the Eller School of Management at the University of Arizona, including as director of the renowned McGuire Center for Entrepreneurship, and then as director of commercialization at the University of Arizona's Technology Commercialization Organization, uh, TechLaunch Arizona. Uh, she's now the director in a private company in Tucson. 
Now, you, you might ask yourself, well, well, wait a minute, what does that have to do with gun control and gun safety? Well, we actually uh, really attempted, the, the members of the league tried very hard to get a representative from the NRA who would be willing to come and sit and talk. Sherry has been a longtime member of the NRA, and uh, while she does not speak for the NRA, she does have her own personal opinions on that. And we thought it was really important to hear from an NRA member where they are coming from so we can get a better understanding. Thank you, Sherry. And Kelly Ireland is a gun violence survivor. You may have seen her guest editorial on this subject on Monday's Arizona Daily Star. She's the co-director of uh, Be Smart, the education program of Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. And I see the ladies here in red. Uh, I bet you they are members of that organization. Um, it's part of the Every Town for Gun Safety. Uh, she'll be telling us a lot about uh, their program to help prevent teen suicides uh, and intended and unintended child shootings. Um, there's not going to be a lot of discussion about the current laws that are being uh, introduced in the state legislature and also uh, Maria uh, Regina Romero also signed on uh, along with many other mayors across the country. Uh, to an organization that helps to prevent gun violence. What we are going to talk about is personal experiences and where people come from. And so we're going to start with the chief who may give us a little bit more on uh, he's a bit of a policy wonk, aren't you? A little bit of yeah, okay. <laughs> it's all yours. So good morning. It is, uh, you know, a beautiful morning like this. The sun coming in, you feel almost a radiant light here, and uh, it's hard to start on it's such a sobering reminder, at least for me, that it was just two weeks ago that a uh, five-year-old girl was shot in the head right here in Tucson by a straight bullet. It was intended uh, from one individual, a gang member, shooting at another uh, person that he knew, but nonetheless, it struck this little child who was getting into a car with her dad. The little girl and her family weren't connected to the shooter or to the, was just an innocent victim. And this sort of reminds us how even the most innocent members of our community can be impacted by gun violence in some pretty dramatic ways. Now on a national level, the most recent uh, data, and it's not great because it's not that recent from the Pew Research Center, showed that almost 40,000 people died from gun-related injuries just in that year. Um, and this doesn't even take into account the number of people who were shot and survived and or um, people who were shot but not struck. Now, here's a problem, and we see this at, with national data, but frankly, it's the case here as well. I can't tell you how many violent crimes we had that involved firearms last year, or, or for that, any, that matter, any year in Tucson, because our data has been incomplete and our ability to do meaningful crime analysis has been just lacking for so long. That was one of my top priorities when I came here was to change that. We now finally have a crime analysis division in the Tucson Police Department with highly credentialed analysts and improved technology and this is going to allow us to better, better gather data which we really need to understand what we're dealing with and to interpret and interpret it in ways that will help us understand the scope of the problem of gun crime in the city. So I hope by next year, as I know this discussion will be continuing, I can give you accurate numbers, at least for 2020, about how many gun crimes we have in the city. But I know that it's going to be a significant number. Now, in Tucson, we know we do have approximately 9,300 reported domestic violence incidents each year. And we also know that many of these crimes involve the threat or actual use of firearms. For example, from 2017 to 19, there were 19 intimate partner homicides in Tucson, and close to 65% of those involved firearms. Across the country, 
percent of the women who are murdered in the United States were killed by intimate partners. Now, again, data is so lacking, and that's part of our challenge. But in 2015, 44 percent of those murders involved a firearm, and by 17, that number had increased to 50 percent. So there's no question we have a problem where that links domestic violence and guns. Shifting gears just a little bit. Um, Although studies have shown that mentally ill individuals and persons in mental health crisis are disproportionately represented as suspects in mass casualty shootings, they're really a small percentage, I think the number is around 4%, of the overall incidents that occur across the country every day. And despite this, there is not a day that goes by where I don't read an officer safety bulletin that comes across my desk about a dangerous not only a person in Tucson threatening to harm others, often police officers involved in a gun. Now, very few police departments have sufficient personnel who are skilled in proactively engaging with dangerous, armed, mentally ill individuals with the goal of preventing shootings, including mass shootings, such as the terrible one that involved Gabby Giffords. We have a mental health services team, we call it MIST, it's made up of about a dozen highly trained detectives and two supervisors. And this team, they not only handle all our Chapter 11 commitments, but they work constantly to stop shootings and other acts of violence before they happen that involve high-risk mentally ill persons or individuals with behavior disorders. Missed officers are the ones who are out there seeking information from folks, friends, neighbors, co-workers, and family members of potential shooters and then trying to act on those tips. But look, I'm going to be candid with you here. We've identified a number of individuals who are very dangerous, but our system for intervention is seriously inadequate. It, it, we just lack the legal tools to prevent tragedies in this state. And a good example of this was the murder of U.S. Marshal Chase White that happened almost uh, a little over a year ago, who was shot and killed while serving a warrant on a seriously deranged individual. We knew who this suspect was, and various legal event interventions had been tried prior to this terrible tragedy. But the system in our state was inadequate to deal with this person, and amazingly, he continued to have access to firearms, including the gun that he used to murder Marshall White. Even with the many gaps and deficiencies in our mental health, legal, and judicial system, I'm still confident that our MIST team has prevented many acts of violence. They are so effective, in fact, at what they do that we have been recognized by the Justice Department as a national learning site. A lot of departments are sending their folks here to learn what we're doing. Now, people ask what tools might be helpful. One of them that would be useful in our state is, our, is sort of a version of a red flag law. You've probably heard of various versions of this, but in 17 states and the District of Columbia, uh, sadly not Arizona, red flag laws uh, allow police and in some cases friends or family members to petition a court to remove guns from people who might pose a threat to themselves or others, or at least during the period of time where they're being evaluated. Red flag laws have emerged as a potentially bipartisan way to curb some of the escalating numbers of uh, mass murders involving some really troubled people. But to make these laws work, it also takes teams like our, our MIST team, which frankly are rare in Arizona and around the country because they got to be the ones out there doing the follow-up. Now, people ask me, what, how do we handle gun crimes? How do we investigate them? How do we address this? And we're lucky to have a really strong gun crimes unit in, at TPD. And so last year, for example, our officers recovered uh, about 1,500 firearms that went through what we call NIBIN processing. Now, NIBIN, and IBIN, it stands for the National Integrated Ballistics Information Network. And, and essentially, it starts with local evidence collection and forensics, and then involves technology and analysis. Now, NIBIN is a cooperative venture between local police departments and the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, ATF. 
The way it works is an IVAN link gets generated when a bullet casing is removed from a crime scene, goes through this processing, and then it matches up potentially with a casing that's collected from another crime scene that might be either locally or elsewhere in the country. Now in 2019, we generated just under 200 investigative leads through NIPIN. And we believe that 200 numbers really more like 4 to 500 if we look at it in terms of separate gun-related incidents. Some shell casings also match to multiple crime cases, so the number of leads really might even be higher than this. Approximately 120 firearm-related cases were issued last year by our three gun crimes unit detectives, and a lot of these are prohibited possessor cases. They do a lot of really tough, dedicated work. So going forward, what are we doing in 2020? Well, personnel from our patrol divisions, investigations, and analysis division are all going to be working together in the most coordinated, efficient, and effective way to even use things like social media and the like to identify, investigate, and assure the prosecution of gun violence cases. Analytical work is critical on this so we know how to deploy the resources we have. But I also want to mention, just in the, in the short time I still have here, some steps that we're taking with our employees in terms of how they handle their duty and professional firearms. Um, this includes providing a personnel with gun locks, which by the way are also available to the public, and implementing a policy on how employees must secure their weapons at home as well as in their vehicles. Last year, we enacted a new policy that reinforces what we expect of our members when it comes to gun safety, and it outlines their responsibility to keep firearms and ammunition secure at all times in their homes, in their vehicles, and any other areas under their control. And this is, I think this is critical. You've heard cases where police officers' guns have been stolen and been used in some pretty terrible crimes. So the idea here is that, you know, if we expect our community members to keep guns out of the hands of those who shouldn't have them, we need to lead by example and demonstrate that in terms of our own accountability for firearms. And then last, we need to recognize that more police officers die from suicide involved in guns on an annual basis than die as a result of gun crimes. And so we've been involved in providing all our employees with mandatory suicide prevention training. This includes strategies on how to get help for yourself, how to intervene appropriately with someone you work with or otherwise know if they're considering self-harm or suicide. Uh, in fact, we think this is so important that as chiefs, we're introducing this training in every single briefing, and then frankly, there's been a well over 100 of these briefings, so we're like running day and night to be at all of these, but we want to let people know how important this is. So I think what I'll do is stop there, but come back maybe um, later in our discussion to talk a little bit more about, we're part of the major city chiefs association, Tucson, sometimes we forget it here, is in fact a major city with a, um, 33rd largest in the country, and uh, MCCA has been for a long, a long time advocate of um, sensible gun policy. We can talk a little bit about some of the things that they are recommending and certainly that I support as well, but uh, I think I'll stop there. So you are doing a lot within the uh, city of Tucson's police department. Uh, Sherry, uh, to you, and again, remind people that while Sherry is a long-time uh, member of the NRA, she does not represent the NRA. Sherry, it's all yours. Thank you, and I want to thank uh, uh, everyone for having me here today. Uh, it's a pleasure, um, if not a little nervous, to, to represent this particular point of view. I'm not often nervous, so uh, it, it's... it's um, it's difficult to hear the kinds of stats that we hear and not feel like uh, there's, there should be an immediate and simple solution because it's not by no means simple, but that we can point to one thing uh, and that might make a big difference. It's a very big and very complex issue uh, and I want to just give a little bit of balance from my perspective. And this, uh, I don't have stats like this. This is my opinion and my experience. Uh, so I'm, I'm pleased to present that. You know, when uh, Kathy reached out to me, they were looking for someone that was perhaps a gun shop owner, um, <clears throat> involved in the industry in some way, 
While I'm not in the gun shop owner, my sister and brother-in-law do own uh, several gun shops uh, as a part of their heavy equipment dealerships in Colorado. I grew up in rural Colorado where uh, uh, gun ownership is just a part of life. Uh, it's there, uh, it's part of the life uh, to some degree out of necessity, but also a part of tradition. It's the lifestyle there. Um, I do believe, and you're going to find out, not, I don't disagree with many things that you'll hear here today, um, we need to have gun wisdom alongside gun rights. I see uh, gun safety and, and other terms, my terms that I use is gun wisdom. I also believe that gun problems begin long before a gun is at play. And that's what I most want to focus on. Um, if we pair gun rights with gun wisdom, but also stepping back and paying attention to what primarily, not just, but primarily, our kids are doing um, and the values that they're raised with, that can have a big impact before a gun ever comes into a situation. I also want to say that I have lost a nephew to stupid gun violence, and I've lost a son to stupid peer violence. And stupid peer violence is pretty close cousin to gun violence. So I'm not, uh, I'm not removed or oblivious to the seriousness of the topic. Um, our society has significant problems that we all need to take responsibility for, and that responsibility goes beyond making a decision about isolating gun rights or removing gun rights. And I think it's really important that we uh, don't let the pendulum effect come into play or the pendulum swings too far. There are things that we have to be able to do that uh, go beyond gun rights and gun ownership. Uh, I'm not a, a wildly active member of the NRA. I support it because it's, it's, a, it's an important value of our country. And I do know that of other NRI members and NRI information that I've been exposed to, uh, the vast majority of NRI members believe in these same things, including the wisdom and society taking responsibility for the problems for the government. Kelly, uh, Arlen, to you. Well, good morning and thank you for having us today. My name is Kelly Ireland, and I, I wear three different hats for the organization. I, uh, I am an Everytown Fellow, gun violence survivor. I've been affected by gun violence three times. Uh, I want to read you a little blurb from Chris Kotcher. He's the director of Everytown Survivor Network. Every town is the umbrella organization for Moms Demand Action against uh, Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America, for Mayors Against Illegal Guns, and Every Town Survivor Network is also in that. So Chris Kotcher is the director of the Survivor Network, of which I'm a part. Gun violence in any form leaves an indelible mark on the lives of those affected. We're committed to building a movement reflecting, reflective of all those who have had a personal connection to gun violence, whether they have had a loved one die by suicide, homicide, or they've been wounded or witnessed an act of gun violence. We know when survivors share their stories, more Americans recognize their own personal connection to gun violence through the power of their voices. So I am one of those voices. America is a nation of survivors. In a recent poll, 58% of American adults reported that they have someone they care for or love who has experienced gun violence in their lifetime. The U.S. gun homicide rate is 25 times that of other high-income countries. More than 22,000 people die by gun-related suicide every year. Access to a gun in the home increases the suicide risk three times. Every single day in America, 100 people die, are shot and killed by guns. And for those 100, two times as many are injured. In 2019, the chief already talked about the 40,000 people that were killed in the United States. And Arizona is the 14th highest 
state in the nation for gun violence. And if you haven't been affected by it, you, a lot of times you don't care that much about it. But you might care about it if you learn that it does affect your pocketbook. The cost of gun violence is about $1.9 billion a year. That's in direct costs, ambulances, and so on, medical treatment. But then it rises to $5.4 billion, not million, billion dollars a year in indirect costs that you and I are paying for. Every month, 52 women are shot to death by an intimate partner. 4.5 million women report being threatened with a gun. The ripple effect of this gun violence distills down to children who are often affected for the rest of their lives by gun violence and domestic violence. On February 7th, 1989, I got the call no parent ever wants to get. On one end of the line was my son's roommate. Just 18 years old, my son Leslie had shot himself and was dead. Leslie had been a happy boy and had always loved to make people laugh. It was his thing. He had a cheeky smile and he was popular, popular with friends and girls. He had been a comedian of sorts, starting as a baby when he learned that he could get a charge out of making people laugh. How could this possibly be my son, the person on the phone was even talking about? That morning, I now know that I had a premonition. That was the day he died. I was at work, everything was fine, but suddenly and inexplicably, I was overcome with intense feelings of dread and darkness. Nothing was clear about what it was, but it moved me to tears. And for the rest of the day, I carried a heaviness within me, not realizing it would, that day was going to change my life forever and the life of everybody who loved him. In the days and months that followed Leslie's death, those days were surreal. It was like living in a Salvador Dali painting. Everything was smeared, everything was wrong. The sun was too bright, the colors were too bright. I could not imagine how people went on with their lives because my world had collapsed, it had imploded. I had severe PTSD but didn't know it at the time. And I could see his death scene played before me like an endless loop. Constantly, I couldn't turn it off. Nothing would make it stop, and I feared for my sanity. In the years since my son's death, it's been 31 <coughs> years, I've realized that bit by bit, I had to rebuild and recover from the devastation caused by that gun. It hasn't just taken me 31 years to tell my story. It's taken me 30 years of actions, forward and backward steps, large and small, to reclaim my life and salvage it. It has taken me 31 years to weave that grief and loss into the tapestry that is my life. Thank you so much. Um, it's, it's hard to hear these stories, and we know that uh, both Sherry and Kelly have uh, personal stories that uh, they are impacted by. Uh, we'd like to ask some folks in the audience to start writing some of your questions so that we can get some of those questions answered. One of the, the subjects that I hear often is comparing the U.S. to Mexico. Mexico has probably some of the strongest, strictest gun laws in the world. Uh, there's only one place that anybody in Mexico can buy guns legally, and that's on a military base. And yet, Mexico's murder rate is uh, at least 40% higher than that in the U.S. So in terms of some countries, just restricting guns to the public is not the answer. Chief, what 
Well, how do you feel about the whole idea of restricting guns as opposed to better education? Well, it, it is uh, ironic to say the least that a great many of the guns that are being used in Mexico to commit the atrocities there are guns that are actually coming from this country going in that direction. So we hear you know, a lot about drugs and things coming up through the border, but from Mexico to the United States, but um, the reverse is really true in terms of what's happening with weapons who are, that are being manufactured and sold, uh, legally sold uh, and then transported into Mexico across the border. Um, I mean, this is such a complicated problem. There is no, it is difficult to say, okay, is the goal restriction? Is the goal, uh, you know, what sort of regulation makes sense? Uh, it is certainly not possible from any practical standpoint to say we're going to remove or that that's even appropriate under any circumstances guns from the hands of many people, the great majority of which are law-abiding citizens that possess them and are very smart about how they've been trained to uh, use them and store them and carry them. So the notion that this pendulum, you know, even if some people wanted it to, could swing all the way in that direction, I think, is not, uh, is not likely and is not practical. What I do think it makes sense to focus on are certain common sense regulations concerning guns, given how dangerous they are and what they're capable of, as well as common sense regulation concerning the people that are potentially buying and using those guns. I think, you know, it wasn't that long ago that it was possible to gain even a bipartisan perspective on a lot of this, but we are now in such a tribalized time and the influence of some bodies uh, such as, frankly, the NRA being one, has become so strong that even things that many members of both parties thought were common sense in terms of universal background checks, dealing with straw purchases, um, uh, filling, the, uh, addressing gun show loopholes, this kind of thing. This doesn't have to be partisan, and it's just a shame that it's that it's taken on that life, especially when such an overwhelming majority of the public supports these sort of common sense um, laws and regulations. And frankly, uh, from what I've seen, a fair number of NRA members do as well. So it really does lead you to wonder, how is it that we've gotten to this place? And then how can we influence our electeds to stay, take a step backwards and you know, really potentially work together to address some of these challenges? Great. Uh, Sherry, for you, um, one of the things people are asking, I've got three or four questions on this, is uh, while you don't speak for the NRA, uh, what does the right to bear arms mean to many of the NRA members? What does that really mean, the right to bear arms? Any arms? Rocket fires? Uh, handguns? What, what does that really mean? Well, clearly, uh, it means different things to different people. For uh, most of the people that I've come into contact with and the reading that I've done, it's, it's about the constitutional right. It's the right to be able to protect oneself. I, I have a gun because I, besides growing up with them, as an adult, I didn't make the choice to acquire a gun until I was working in Phoenix and drove back and forth all the time. Uh, and you know, being concerned that I may break down on I-10 somewhere. Uh, not having to worry that I am not able to do that and wonder what I might be able to do, how I might protect myself. I'm also a single mother of five. Um, the, the ability to, not that I would ever want to use it, I mean, I think most NRA members dream is that they never actually have to fire that gun unless it's in, in a, a controlled environment, in, in a range or something. I would never want to use it but the right to bear arms means if I make the choice that that's how I'm going to uh, defend myself or honor my traditions, that I can do it. There's also the issue of high capacity weapons. There's the issue of gun collectors. Um, 
Kelly, uh, how do you feel about that, the restriction of some of the high-capacity type weapons that really do major damage when they're in the hands of people who are out to cause major damage? Actually, what I'm really here to talk about this morning is safe gun storage. I want to pivot back to uh, the Chief and to Sherry's comments about gun wisdom or common sense gun kinds of situations. And uh, I always have problems remembering if it was Mark Twain or Will Rogers or Plato who said common sense is not that common. And so uh, I, I am a co-leader along with Carol Hammond and McMillan who's sitting in the second row over there in a gray shirt like mine. And we go around doing programs on safe gun storage. And our program is called Be Smart. And S-M-A-R-T is the acronym that we use about S standing for secure your guns if you have them. Uh, Carol and I go to all kinds of festivals and different tabling events around town. And you would be surprised how many people say, well, our guns are secure. They're in the closet in our bedroom and the kids aren't allowed to go there. They don't know where they are. And the kids are standing behind going, yeah, we do. <laughs> I knew where the guns were kept when I was a kid. Didn't you? So we want them secure, meaning locked up and the ammunition stored separately. And in cars as well. Don't keep them in the console. Uh, keep them locked up in a gun safe. Gun safes are small now, you can put them in a car. The M of SMART it stands for model. That would be model safe behavior. Guns are not toys. There's some real cute guns out there, some pink ones with pink bullets to go in your little fancy purse with a little pocket where you can store your gun. People treat them like toys, they're not toys. They shouldn't be left like laying on the coffee table. Every year, 300 or more small children under the age of 11 get a hold of a gun that's sitting on a coffee table, a bedside, under a pillow, under a mattress. So model safe behavior. A in SMART is ask. You know, if your child has a peanut allergy, or if your child is afraid of dogs and he or she goes to visit somebody, you're going to ask, are you going to serve any food that has nuts in it because my child is really violently sick? Why don't you ask if they have guns? And if you do, ask them if they're secured. And if they say yes, ask them how. And if they say in, the, in dad's underwear drawer, that's not secured. So ask, 4.6 million children live in homes with unsecured guns, I'm telling you. The R in SMART is recognize the signs of suicidal behavior. Recognize them, get to know them. We have information there about suicide warning signs. It's out at our Be Smart table. We want people to talk to their children about gun safety. But we don't want people to make the kids responsible for it. It's the adults that are responsible for it, not the kids. And the last letter in SMART is T, and that's tell people about our programs. We go to doctor's offices, we will go to PTAs, PTOs, we will go to any business anywhere. We have been to the police station. We go to festivals, we spread the word, tell people about our program. We come and do these programs for free. Free. And we'll talk to you about safe gun storage. We have a gun safe. We demonstrate how quickly people can get into it if they need to get into it right away. And that's really what I'm here to talk about. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, nice pivot, by the way. And the reporter. Uh, Chief, there's uh, a whole stack of questions here where folks want to know <laughs> more about background checks. Can you enlighten us right now on what, what are the background checks that are being done currently here in our community, across the state, and even across the nation? Where do we stand? What has happened? Well, a, a background check, you know, that's done when you purchase a gun, you believe, through a licensed firearms dealer, um, involves basic things like um, it goes to a system where you can tell if somebody has a, a criminal record, frankly, but, and there's certain questions that are asked of that person, but it's, 
it's by and large voluntary on their part as to how they answer those questions and the ability to verify that information is, is very minimal. The, the challenge, you know, a, a better designed universal background check would have access to databases that tell you, um, you know, somebody has not only active warrants, but a history of uh, using weapons inappropriately, um, would tell you about if they have a mental health commitment um, or, protect, or uh, protective order or any of a range of things that might um, influence whether or not they could or should safely be able to purchase a gun. The, the, the part that is so frustrating and challenging, however, is even with the inadequacy of that, there are many more um, opportunities for people to purchase or, or obtain guns that do not involve going through any sort of um, you know, firearms dealer that is following the legally required protocols. There, there are um, these gun show loopholes that, that where nothing, there's no check of any kind. There's transfers of guns between private parties where people take no time or effort to do um, anything beyond just exchange of cash uh, for guns. Um, there are guns that are sold through, uh, that are obtained through straw purchases where, you know, a person that um, is not even going to be the gun owner uh, illegally basically purchases the gun because they don't have a problem with their background and then they just provide it to somebody who has a very problematic background. So I am far and away not an expert on all of all of this and, or on the exact uh, solutions. There are people that have been working on this for a long time who are far more knowledgeable than I am, but I do know that what we have now is grossly inadequate and it not only is a disservice to the safety of the larger public, but it's frankly makes it very difficult and unsafe for police officers to do their job, which of course is also a great concern to me. Sherry, about the idea of being able to purchase these weapons at gun shows and through private vendors. I know, again, you don't speak for the NRA, but you, you must have some personal feelings about that. And what do people who are NRA members, who you interact with, is this something that would be agreeable to them, not so much? To be able to restrict those, uh, those sales in the gun shows and the private sales. I think that that falls under uh, gun wisdom and the ability to make sure that, that people that should not have a weapon don't have access to it, but that, that has to really err on the side of not restricting someone that, that should. It's a really difficult balance, and I would say uh, of those that I might be able to speak for, and again, I don't speak for the, uh, the NRA, I do come from a long line of, of gun owners, um, you have to you have to work harder to protect the rights of those that still that should have the right to own it. Um, it's a difficult balance. I've had to I've had to undergo background checks. I've also been able to buy weapons without any background check. The chief isn't that the issue is that um, or is it even the issue that most of these homicides and many of the homicides and illegal gun use are are being perpetrated by people who slip through the system, the system that exists. Is can that I, the case? Can I just sure. uh, continue the, the answer and, and uh, to your response? I, I would be really interested to know and uh, what the influences are in countries. Uh, we've already noted that Mexico has very tight gun laws. They're getting them from here. If we restrict, restrict individuals' ability to, to get guns, they're going to get them somewhere else. Or does, the, does the, the violence take on a different nature? Does it become a different kind of violence if guns are not accessible? I still maintain that there are deeper root problems that require sure. the energy and attention uh, in lieu of only targeting the gun ownership. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not really sure exactly what the, 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 the question is that we're addressing. Are there, the, 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 if the question is, um, do we know where the guns are coming from that are being used in a lot of violent crime? Part of the problem is we really, because the 
because Congress, and this is frankly long before the election of, of the current president, um, Congress, who had been greatly influenced by the NRA, let's be candid about it, with a lot of money, um, has made it next to impossible to do research on what is actually going on in terms of um, crimes and deaths involving firearms. We research almost everything else in this country, um, and yet um, in this particular area where, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of lives are being lost um, that involve guns, we have next to no reliable research that tells us, um, you know, which guns are being used under which circumstances. Certainly, a lot of the guns that we're confiscating and dealing with and, and even the analysis that we're doing with Nibin points to particular weapons that are being exchanged between groups of people um, and absolutely being used, in, in fact, in many cases repeatedly and in different crimes to kill and injure people. But, you know, so much of what we know, unfortunately, is anecdotal and that, that really needs to change. Um, I'm not sure of this fact. Somebody submitted this question. It says one third of intimate partner homicides occur within one month of an arrest order being issued. Uh, how can we keep women safe during that critical time where tempers are really flared and anger is existing? Chief, any thoughts on that? And this goes to all of you if you have some ideas and suggestions. Well, one of the things we're fortunate to be doing here in Pima County, um, including the Tucson Police Department, is we have a violence, uh, a risk assessment tool. It's called an appraise tool that officers use when they're dealing with, um, the, they're at the scene of domestic violence cases and someone is being arrested for DV. And it's a very basic series of questions that the victim is asked that try to assess their risk for um, a lethal encounter in the near future. And depending on how high they score on this assessment, uh, there are a number of different types of interventions that are made, including bringing, uh, getting um, advocates and support services uh, to them, connecting up with them as quickly as possible, taking other steps to try to keep them safe. Uh, I think this is, is very important, but you know, one of the things that's been kind of alarming to us, and I think the, the folks that emerge, or the domestic violence providers and others would tell you, is that um, at least here, and again, there's, not, there's a limited number of departments that are using this tool around the country, but the number of victims that end up scoring in the highest risk possible category was way beyond any of our expectations. Um, and so this really, this speaks to the need for services. It speaks for just how dangerous that period is following an arrest or how much risk a lot of these DV, DV victims are in. And it's really been a challenge for both police and service providers to address just how how lethal, uh, how likely a uh, lethal encounter may be often involving guns. It, it's a very, it, it surprised all of us. Good. Kelly, you want to take a swing at that one? <laughs> it just brings to mind a, a, a woman I just met when I went for, um, for fellow training who was shot five times by her domestic partner as he was trying to kill the three children and she was shielding them. And she walks around with five bullets in her, cell, in her body and she named all of them uh, just to remind her what she had been through. I'm not really here to talk about anything but safe gun storage. <laughs> <laughs> we took a shot at it anyway. You can take a shot at it, and I have a lot of opinions, and a lot of my opinions may not um, coincide with other people's opinions on guns. But uh, certainly there are far too many incidents of domestic violence involving guns in America. Cherry, um, would you like to address that? Um, only to say that I think that this is a great example of the, the, the 
challenges in society that we have to take responsibility for at the source of the challenge, not when it results in gun violence. I, I applaud the efforts of the Tucson police. I've been in that position where, uh, where, where behavioral health issues were involved mm -hmm. and having to have someone removed from the home. It was a difficult thing. I thought it was going to be an easy thing. It was a difficult thing. And he was back out within you know four hours and uh, left feeling unsafe. So finding those kinds of solutions, I applaud those efforts. Um, also, Sherry, uh, one of our audience members said that uh, you stated that uh, folks in rural Colorado own guns out of necessity, uh, as well as tradition. Can you explain a little bit more about what does out of necessity mean? Well, by rural Colorado, I mean rural Colorado. Um, uh, so uh, firearms are used uh, for cases of wild animals, snakes, um, other kinds of intruders uh, for hunting. Uh, many of my family members, we, you know, we didn't buy meat at the store. We actually hunted and, and uh, uh, put up the meat and froze it for the year. It's actually a, a very real part of life. Uh, Chief, also, one of, the, um, one of the folks here wanted to ask you a little bit more about uh, many of many uh, folks who are shot by police, that is a form of, for them, uh, gun violence or excessive force. What is your department doing to address the whole issue of excessive force and how your department, your officers, relate to the public when it comes to using that excessive force? So I think we need to clarify that not all force is excessive force. And in fact, there are circumstances where the use of deadly force is in fact necessary and appropriate, not only potentially to protect the life of the police officer who's in the situation, but frankly, in many cases, to protect the life of somebody else who's, who's threatened either by a gun or other form of, of, of violence. I do, however, believe that the key to the way officers use force comes down to a combination of things. First of all, departments should have good policies in this area. There are a number of places where those policies are available at this point, some of them from groups like the Police Executive Research Forum, all the way to the International Association of Chiefs of Police. You can work with any of a number of advocacy groups out there to help develop policies that are, are smart and comprehensive and rational around the use of force. Second, training is critical. We put a lot of resources into training so that our officers know how to utilize, when and how to utilize force. And there's a big difference between, for example, even firing a gun at a range, um, you know, to qualify, for example, which cops have to do every year for accuracy and uh, capability purposes. There's a big difference between doing that and learning how to use force under stressful circumstances, which is a lot different and often what cops are encountering in the field. So training is incredibly important and it has to involve more than just the use of a firearm, of course. A lot of our training is geared around less than lethal resources. Um, that could be a taser, it could be uh, a baton, it could be any of a number of other things that are less lethal than a, than a gun. And, and then, perhaps most importantly, the idea of de-escalation whenever possible. De-escalation skills are, are often challenging. Uh, they can't be applied in every situation. If somebody is pointing a gun at you, you're not generally in a position to de-escalate that. But there are many circumstances where what you can do is create distance, in other words, what we call, cops hate to say retreat, right? That, that's, uh, they've taught you never retreat, but what we call tactical repositioning, where they learn, if possible at all. Well, sometimes it's all in the wording, right? And where you learn how to 
you know, move back out of the situation, create time. Time and distance can be so important. And the idea that that can be a le legitimate response to somebody who is in possession of a weapon or in particular even a firearm. Um, these are things that we're teaching, training, supervision. I think another piece of this is the way that cops are expected to document the force that they use. Our officers wear body cameras, for example, which we look at very carefully in every one of these circumstances. And then the idea of accountability overall, which means we have a process of force review board that looks at all of these incidents and tries to, what can we learn from them? Is there something we could have done differently? What do we take from what sometimes is a tragedy and find something that we can use to make our response to similar circumstances better in the future? So we're a department that takes the issue of the use of force very seriously, but at the same time, I'll go back to my original point, which is not every police officer fatal shooting represents misconduct on the part of the officer or even a bad choice. Some of those are absolutely necessary, unavoidable, and let me assure you, there's, you know, our officers who have been in that circumstance, there's nothing about that that they like. They go through a lot afterwards. Uh, their actions are closely and carefully looked at. They're reviewed by the county attorney, but they're also reviewed internally through an administrative process. And I mean, it's very, the idea of taking a life under any circumstances is probably the most stressful thing they'll go through in the course of their careers. So I just think that is, again, another complicated circumstance, but I think our department here in Tucson is well ahead of the curve in terms of how we're training and looking at these issues. Well, there are no easy answers, are there? Uh, Sherry, one of uh, our audience members say, um, how do you respond to the slippery slope myth that common sense gun laws and awareness will lead to guns being taken away eventually, that this is just the beginning of the end of gun ownership? How, how do you uh, respond to that personally? And maybe even on the part of some friends who are also uh, gun owners and gun sales people. Um, it's, a, it's a concern. I think that it, it is a slippery slope. We're not saying, yes, it will happen, but I think there's a likelihood that it happens, and that's what I mean by the pendulum swing too far. You see a little bit of success, you start to chip away at it, and there is X degree of likelihood that at some point you have a population that has been disarmed, and at that point you have a society that is at risk. How far do you think NRA members would go towards compromise? on the whole idea of restricting things. Is it an all or nothing proposition? I doubt it. I doubt it's all or nothing. I would be, I personally would be open to some compromise, but again, we have to err on the side of, of the rights and the constitutional rights that people do have. Kelly, anything uh, to say about that? <laughs> I, have a, I have a great question for you if you want to take it. I don't think Hold on a second. The, yeah. the chief has something to say about that. I, I just would make the observation that there are a lot of other um, aspects of life on a daily basis where we understand and accept that there are um, laws and restrictions about what we do in order to have access to something. For example, VFS. No, nobody would suggest that by having to take a test in order to drive a vehicle and having to follow certain laws that go with that to be out on the road, that that is the start of a slippery slope that's going to keep everybody from being able to drive going forward. No, nobody would say that having to go through uh, the TSA at an airport is a slippery slope to uh, not being able to travel freely. I mean. I get it, anything could be taken to an extreme, but what frustrates and disappoints me sometimes uh, about uh, the NRA and certain um, advocates with, within that organization is that, you know, you can't say we're afraid of the, you know, right now they are in the position of the far extreme of 
of the pendulum, if we want to look at it that way. There on the far end of... And, you know, the answer to that is not saying, well, anything that moves us towards a more rational middle is going to inevitably result in the other opposite end. We are people, you know, if we really have all this common sense that we talk about, and if we're able to legislate effectively on so many other areas of life, there ought to be a way where we bring the pendulum somewhere into that rational middle without having to be on either far end of the spectrum. <laughs> Did you want to respond to that? I do. And I don't disagree with any of that. I started by saying that I'm, I am for compromise. Mm -hmm. It just has to be smart compromise and not be unfair compromise. Mm -hmm. uh, I've heard and, and have actually used the, the, the vehicle ownership uh, as a, a parallel in the past uh, and vehicle use. I, I would like to point attention also to other damages that are out there that, that we're not really doing anything about. Some of the, uh, the, the incredibly painful and sometimes catastrophic effects of the way that social media impacts our young children and so forth are worthy of as much attention. But is that saying, don't, don't pick on me, pick on them? Oh, no, no, not at all, not at all. I was going back to my original statements of there, there are a lot of problems that we need to solve the problems, not just yeah, remove sure. the gun from the, from the formula. That's got it. Kelly, for you, um, someone is asking, do you blame matches for arson? Do you blame cars for 40,000 deaths in 2018? Do you blame water? for about 3,500 drownings a year. Why blame guns for crime? Well, can I just go back to the statement I made when I first came in here about this nation having, well, Chief Magnus did too, 40,000 deaths a year from guns. Now, let me ask you this. If we had 40,000 cases of Ebola virus, here in the United States. What do you think would happen? I'll tell you what would happen. People would start believing in science again because they would want scientists figuring out a way to stop that. We don't even have that many drunk drivers killed every year. So we need to do something about gun violence. And uh, you ask about my opinion on things, um, I, I, I'm just gonna say to you, please go home and Google, we all love Google, go home and Google your state legislators and your state senators who have lined their pockets with NRA money. Yeah. 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 For it. Check it out, check it out. And that leads right into another question uh, that is being asked by three or four other folks about the NRA. Is the NRA <clears throat> not so much about Second Amendment rights as it is about money and selling weapons? And, uh, you know, there's a whole industry there that is trying to protect itself, as many industries would. Uh, you want to take a swing at that one? What do you think about the NRA, NRA's true motives? Every organization and every government and every company can, uh, uh, when they find that they have a position of influence or a position of need, take wrong turns. Um, my choice to be an NRA member is based on my desire to protect the rights of individual gun ownership. I don't make the choice on a daily basis uh, to, to advocate for or even be informed about all of the things that the NRA does it seems to be the only game in town to help protect individual rights to gun ownership. Uh, if I had the desire or the, the, the time to <clears throat> caucus and impact the lobbying effect that the NRA, uh, the NRA currently has, I would do that. Others can do that. There's also other ways to influence through legislature and so forth. It's not something 
uh, that is unstoppable. It, there are parts of it that are very good. There are parts of it that are very bad. I mean, if you even look at organizations, <clears throat> there are other massive organizations that do incredible lobbying uh, and, and have huge business, business interests. AARP is one of them. Um, there are a lot of ways that these things can be manifest. doesn't mean I believe in them or many of the members believe in them, but there has to be some entity to protect individual rights. Chief, this one's for you. How are your officers trained regarding biases of race, ethnicity, using gun violence as immediate reaction? How are they trained using gun violence? I seem to avoid using How to gun avoid, violence. Um, regarding um, the bias of race and ethnicity. Well, I mean, we do training on implicit bias, on unconscious bias, with the idea of educating our personnel that any of us are capable of having biases which can carry over into how we treat people in the community and that it's important to be aware of those biases so we can counter them in every way possible. I personally think the best way to counter um, bias is to be engaged with the community because the more you're engaged with different aspects of the community, particularly those that might be different from your background and life experience, the more likely you are to um, put aside those biases or stereotypes that we all develop over the course of our life. So one of the things that's very important to me is that we're as community engaged as possible. We want our officers to be doing more than just taking calls for service um, or making traffic stops. We want them to be out in neighborhoods, getting to know people, being part of community meetings, being part of problem solving efforts in the community, uh, being exposed to different things that are different than what they've had before. I think that's the best. When we learn about each other, when we start to communicate um, and build trust, then that leads to better outcomes with dealing with the larger community. And that's something you can't take for granted. We're working hard to do that. Um, but I would also suggest that police officers are not the only ones that carry with them implicit bias. This is something that is throughout the entire criminal justice system and frankly throughout society as a whole. And so efforts to change that are something that I think there are a lot of different professions and groups should be involved in, in addition to police. Thank you. Um, one of the questions, in fact, I have four questions about this, and this goes to all of you. Should uh, individuals convicted of nonviolent felonies be able to own a weapon down the road? Should, should they have that right taken away from them if they were convicted of nonviolent felonies? Chief, we'll start with you and go right down. I would say they should have that right, yes. I believe they should have the right. How about you? It depends. <laughs> <laughs> on what? Depends on what they've done. I'm not anti-gun. I'm not anti-gun owner. A lot of the people that belong to Moms Demand Action are gun owners themselves. I do believe in responsible gun ownership. I do believe in common sense gun laws that are designed to take into account those 40,000 people who die every year and the 80,000 or more people who are injured by guns. So I'm not anti-Second Amendment. I believe that the Second Amendment and gun rights and uh, gun uh, Second Amendment and gun sense legislation can coexist. But as, as I think we're all saying in here, there has to be a happy medium. There has to be a happy medium. Because gun violence is America's Ebola. And people will sit, use the thing of, well, guns don't kill people. People do. Well, as it turns out, guns do kill people. Thank you. Sherry, would you like to respond to that? No. <laughs> okay, that's good. Um, can, 
We've talked a lot about the Second Amendment, and that is the right to bear arms. Can you guys tell me what you believe the Second Amendment really means? What does it mean from your perspective, Chief, as a law enforcement officer, from your perspective as an NRA member, and for your, from your perspective as a, a, a gun violence person? Chief? Well, really, I think the one of the primary functions of, of, a, of a police department is, is to uphold the Constitution. And that doesn't just include certain amendments, it includes all amendments of the Constitution, uh, including the Second Amendment. So people do have, uh, certainly have a right to bear arms, but frankly, there are conditions and laws that govern many of the amendments of the Constitution. They don't just stand on their own in a vacuum. You know, in a vacuum, and I think we also have to look at the time and circumstances in which the Constitution was adopted. I don't think that at a point where people were carrying certain types of weapons or, or using them back at that time, they ever could have possibly envisioned some of the weapons that people are using now, or some of the circumstances under under which they're being used. So, part of the job of of uh, legislation, a legislative body like the Congress, uh, people we elect should be to look at, okay, where are we now as a nation? How do we still apply the underlying principle that the founders were adopting, but make that relevant to the world that we live in today? Do people need to be carrying uh, high capacity uh, weapons? Do they need to be carrying really weapons of war as a means of, of protection? I, I totally get, um, you know, what's being said about there's certain parts of the country where, you know, and I've, I've lived in several of them where this, people are out on their own in remote places. Uh, the ability for law enforcement to respond in a timely way is really tough. People who really do need to have potentially something to protect themselves, and they also use guns for other purposes involving hunting and things like this. It is part of a, a tradition, and I understand that. But, you know, let's get real. We're talking about also major urban areas where police are right around the corner, and, you know, in Tucson even, I get it, people sometimes complain about response time related to things like, you know, crimes that have occurred cold burglaries or other things like that where it can be a long time. But if you're in a situation for a level one crime that involves risk to you, immediate risk to your life and safety, our response time is less than five minutes. It's, you know, the need for, I think the need for a gun is greatly diminished in, in urban environments. And so what kinds of conditions ought to reasonably reasonably be put on how guns are kept and utilized has to consider the fact this is really a diverse landscape in the United States. And we ought to have the ability to let, um, you know, legislators make gun specific legislation that's more appropriate for certain areas as we've seen in New York and, and other urban cities. Um, and then consider in the country and rural areas, maybe there's some different standards that ought to apply, but at the base of it all, there would still be things like universal background checks, ways that guns are appropriately sold, circumstances in which people wouldn't be able to possess a gun, like when they're deemed to be uh, dangerous to others as a result of mental illness or behavioral disorder. These are just reasonable things that should apply across the board. And the other things, I think, can become more geographic, specific, and left to legislators on a more local level. Sherry, how about you? What does the Second Amendment mean to you as an NRA member? Well, I, I want to answer that in, in two ways. One, I am here as the NRA member. I don't identify myself. That It's not my being is that I am an NRA member. I don't have a bumper sticker, I don't, I don't carry the card in my wallet. Um, I honestly do not know how I would feel about the whole topic if I didn't grow up in an area where this was a part of life and a necessary and, and, and traditional and customary part of life. But I am also, I, I consider myself a true patriot 
my license plate says the free on it. Uh, I'm a constitutionalist. And from my own perspective, the right to bear arms in the Constitution, I weigh alongside every other right that is given to me and to others in the Constitution and feel as passionately about protecting those until the, 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 the due process occurs to change it. And then I will respect whatever it is then. Um, there are rights afforded for you know, the ability to own the rights to your own inventions. I, I advocate for those rights. I, adv I advocate for the rights of this country because they were fought for and they were given to us and a lot of people have, have put a lot on the line to continue to protect them. And that's the core of how I feel about the right to bear arms. Kelly, the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment. <clears throat> the second part of the Second Amendment that says amendment is the part I like. It needs to be amended. What Chief Magnus said about uh, updating it, making it relevant to today's kinds of weapons and firearms is what concerns me. I want to see that happen. We don't live in an age of muskets anymore. We don't need an AR-15 to go deer hunting. I grew up in a rural area too. I grew up in Globe, Arizona, a town of 8,000 people, and a town, by, by the way, which has just had its first mass shooting in my hometown. So I would like to see some changes to the Second Amendment, not to take away the right to bear arms, but to make common sense amendments to it, change it up make it relevant to today's weaponry. You don't need armor-piercing bullets. I don't want to go to a movie theater and worry about being shot. I don't want to go into bashes and stand behind a guy that's got a bandolero on and a gun hanging off his hip. I don't need to see that. So, again, I believe in the right to bear arms. I think the Second Amendment needs to be fixed. One of the big concerns in this uh, audience here has to do with uh, our schools and protecting our children in, in our schools. Um, Chief Magnus, first to you. Uh, what is happening currently here in Tucson in the surrounding area to train teachers, to train uh, officers uh, when it comes to our schools? And do we scare our children more by telling them, be careful of that guy with a gun, or is it something that has become a necessary? Well, here's what I think we shouldn't do in schools is the idea of either requiring or incentivizing school personnel who wouldn't otherwise ever be carrying a gun or feel comfortable with a gun or even know how to use a gun to have to have one with them in, in a classroom or in a school setting. I, I think that's absolutely ridiculous. Why? Well, I, I mean, police officers spend literally uh, a, a significant portion of their career learning how to appropriately use guns. I mean, I just answered a question from people about, you know, what their expectations are related to how police use force, and in particular deadly force. So given the amount of training, policy, oversight, supervision, um, and accountability that goes with that, how then does it make sense that you would encourage someone who doesn't regularly carry a gun necessarily, have any ongoing practice or training on how to use it or even store it, to have that with them in a classroom setting, I, I just, I don't get how that makes sense. That sounds like somebody's idea of political rhetoric for purposes of, I don't know what. But it does, I, I think that's craziness and having more guns in a school just seems like an invitation for more people, potentially even young people, to have access to them and use them in ways that could be dangerous, even deadly. So what I would propose instead is the idea that, yes, it makes sense, particularly in larger schools, to have uh, folks on campus. Uh, I think uh, school resource officers are excellent in this regard if they're well-trained. Uh, for them to be armed and to be available to respond if there was a, a problem, that, that makes total sense. 
Um, I think it also makes sense for students to um, have a lot of discussions starting early on about things related to not only gun safety and protocols if you were to have a shooting incident on a school campus, but even more importantly, to openly be discussing uh, suicide prevention, um, which is to be talking about bullying and how that leads to folks sometimes bringing a gun to school and wanting to harm other people, to be addressing a range of issues that cause young people to feel so ostracized from their peers and others that they see a gun as the only solution to um, address those problems. So we need to be talking about all of these things in schools, but yes, it doesn't make sense to have trained uh, police or security who know how to protect other people on a campus. Uh, sadly, in this day and age, yes, it probably does, and other sorts of protocols for school safety and training. Yeah, absolutely. But is that is that really the bigger picture of what's contributed? You know, of how you address some of this violence? I, I don't think that's. You got to have the discussions, the education, and. The, um, really understanding of this. Sherry, how do you feel about that? I think I go back to my earliest statement that these are issues that we have to accept responsibility for. We need to be aware of what uh, what is going on with individuals, with the kids. Um, in, in so many cases where there's been horrific gun violence, there were warning signs that were disregarded. Um, or, or otherwise not acted on and you know, let's put the effort and energy into being willing to uh, uh, have those kinds of necessary interventions uh, and then maybe there's less gun violence and less gun issues to worry about. What about the Chief's uh, point that uh, folks who are not trained uh, not carry weapons within a school, a teacher or you know a, a a parent or, or whatever, should anybody who carries a gun in a school be trained almost as much as a police officer is trained? Oh my gosh, yes. And But gun rights go both ways. If you don't want to carry a gun, you certainly should not have to carry a gun. <laughs> Includes um, teachers. I agree. I agree about that. Uh, as far as bullying and, and children suffering with mental illnesses, depression, anxiety, those kinds of things. Um, a lot of times that begins in junior high and high school. And, you know, we've seen altogether too many incidences of school shootings. And in 78% of those shootings, the gun came from home. So there does need to be a change in the way people look at accountability. But there also needs to be a change for teachers you can just about talk to almost any teacher and they're going to say the idea of arming teachers is not their bag. They're educators. They don't want to carry guns. I happen to have a conversation with a teacher, a young man, a young veteran, who said, um, my kids ask me if I could protect them. They know I'm a veteran. They know I know how to use a gun. Could you protect me if we have a school shooter come in? And he said, I had to tell him, I don't know. I don't know. So that doesn't really help them feel safe. And further, when you have 950 children to one school counselor, you've got a problem. And that's what we have here. 950, almost 1,000 children for one school counselor is not enough. Further, we do not pay our teachers enough to walk around with guns. And in a situation, an emergent situation, if a school shooter comes in to a class, I guarantee you mayhem will break out, kids will be scattering everywhere, and that teacher may very unintentionally kill or injure children trying to protect them. There's a level of training 
that cannot possibly be met for teachers. And if they don't want to have to carry the burden of having a weapon, they shouldn't have to. And it shouldn't be a law that they have to. Thank you. Um, one of the questions that's been asked a couple of times is uh, if you want to dispose of a gun or have it removed from a family member or friend uh, at risk, what do you do, Chief? What, what does that person do? Those are sort of two different questions. So if you want to, if you are uncomfortable with having a gun in the house, sometimes guns are passed down generationally, or somebody was in the military and they had a gun, they pass away, the spouse is like, here's the gun, I really don't know what to do with it. Um, those are circumstances in which you're certainly welcome to contact the police department. Um, you can, you know, if you don't even want to handle the gun, you can come pick it up. We're happy to help with circumstances like that. Um, I, I do want to point out that it's fascinating that coming to a state where there's so much emphasis on um, local government rights and um, the ability of people to make choices locally about how they want to handle issues that, you know, the city of Tucson through its elected body, the city council made a determination that guns that were taken in by the police department or in particular confiscated as a result of crimes, in other words, crime guns, that instead of being able to uh, legally dispose of those guns, which was the choice of the council, um, that the city had to, uh, police department has to actually uh, turn those over to be sold again which, you know, sort of leave no gun behind, apparently, is the uh, mentality here. But more ironic is just the idea that um, local rights apparently don't apply on, on gun issues, which is fascinating. Um, but yes, if somebody, if that's how they want to dispose of a gun, they're welcome to contact us, we'll help with that. The much more problematic question that we can't even, we don't really even have time to get into here is, okay, so you're dealing with somebody who is um, perhaps mentally ill, has a behavioral disorder. Um, you know, there are sociopathic personalities that are in possession of these weapons. People know about it, family members, colleagues, friends know about it, and they're like, what can we do? And that is a huge challenge that the, you know, that the legislature and the governor just don't really seem um, serious about addressing because the ability to have, we have the, we have the ability through a petitioning process to have people evaluated for uh, danger to self and others and to make a determination whether they need further mental health treatment or care. The problem is if they're in possession of guns, what can we do about that in the meantime? That's where the red flag laws come in and that's where we continually struggle. So, very complicated issue. Boy, nothing simple, is there? I think uh, the first thing we have to do is talk about it. And uh, I applaud you folks for coming here and at least being willing to listen to multiple sides of this. I apologize to both of you for putting you on the spot as representatives. I know you're not, but boy, thank you for your background, for your experience. We really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, we're we're going to wrap things up here. And again, thank you so much. I, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. I really wanted a diversity of opinions. I think we got them here. So I thank you all for coming today. <laughs>